tonight. The impeachment hearing heads to the House Judiciary Committee. We're on Capitol Hill with the latest as legal experts testify on if President Trump committed an impeachable offense by asking Ukraine to investigate Joe Biden. Plus, as world leaders wrap up the 70th NATO summit, why some question if Turkey should be a part of the alliance. And thousands of Americans go bankrupt each year because of medical debt. How churches are stepping up to help. All this and more tonight on Faith Nation. Making the legal case for impeachment on Capitol Hill. Welcome to Faith Nation. I'm John Jessup. And I'm Jenna Browder. Today, the House Judiciary Committee picking up the impeachment torch by holding its first public hearing. The committee heard from four constitutional law experts on what constitutes high crimes and misdemeanors mentioned in the Constitution. House Democrats called three witnesses. Republicans had one. And as CP News Capitol Hill correspondent Abigail Robertson reports, even the legal experts were split down party lines. New committee, similar script, and same drama. Three witnesses called by Democrats testified to their belief President Trump committed an impeachable offense. The sole GOP witness argued that not only does the situation not meet constitutional impeachment standards, he feels this entire process sets a dangerous precedent. President Trump's conduct, as described in the testimony and evidence, clearly constitutes impeachable high crimes and misdemeanors under the Constitution. Jonathan Turley, the Republican witness, opened by making one thing clear. I'm not a supporter of President Trump. I voted against him. But then laid out his case for why he's against impeaching Trump. I believe this impeachment not only fails to satisfy the standard of past impeachments, but would create a dangerous precedent for future impeachments. Warning of what this could mean for future presidents. This would be the first impeachment in history where there would be considerable debate, and in my view, not compelling evidence of the commission of a crime. While other witnesses cautioned of a different precedent being set. If what we're talking about is not impeachable, then nothing is impeachable. And expressed concern Trump will solicit foreign interference again. The evidence reveals a president who used the powers of his office to demand that a foreign government participate in undermining a competing candidate for the presidency. House Democrats appear ready for the next steps. We cannot wait for the election to address the present crisis. While Republicans argue Democrats have planned this since the 2016 election. You just don't like the guy. The House Judiciary Committee will be tasked with officially drawing up articles of impeachment if they decide to move forward. But Democrats say there is no specific timeline yet on when the articles could be brought to the floor. Reporting from Capitol Hill, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Thank you, Abby. Since the start of the impeachment inquiry, President Trump has maintained he's done nothing wrong. White House correspondent Ben Kennedy joins us from the North Lawn with what President Trump is saying tonight. Well, Jenna, John, President Trump hit back, calling today's hearing boring and doesn't think people were watching. He made these comments while in the U.K. for the NATO summit, and it is there he pushed back on the impeachment inquiry and again that he did nothing wrong. Read the transcript and then listen to what the president of Ukraine said. He said there was no pressure whatsoever. There will be no quid pro quo. I said that. And I said other things that were even stronger than that. And, you know, it's, it's a disgrace that they are doing this. And you heard Abigail talk about this at the beginning of her piece. The commander in chief then criticized today's hearings fairness, pointing out to the number of constitutional scholars each side got to call. They get three constitutional lawyers and we get one. What's that all about? Just that little statement. They get three. We get one. We had no representation. We couldn't call witnesses. We couldn't do anything. It is the most unfair thing that anybody's ever seen. President Trump then used some choice words to describe top Democrats behind this impeachment inquiry. He called them out by name. Take a listen. It's an absolute disgrace to our country. It's sad, actually. 
uh, and it's done by, you know, frankly, losers. You look at the people, look at the cast of characters between Nadler and Schiff and Pelosi, Nervous Nancy. It's an absolute disgrace to our country. Now, today, Trump said a lot of Democrats in the House will most likely vote against removing him from office. He says lawmakers are getting hammered by their districts, and a yes vote could actually jeopardize their chances of reelection. Odds are there could be a vote by year's end, and if the House does, in fact, vote to impeach, then Trump thinks he'll get a, quote, fair shake in the Republican-controlled Senate. John Jenna. All right. Thank you, Ben Kennedy at the White House. Well, joining us now is David Brody, CBN political chief, uh, chief political Who analyst. Got it there. David, uh, can you explain for both us and the average viewer the difference between the Intelligence Committee hearings from a couple of weeks ago and today's opening with the Judiciary Committee? Right. Intelligence Committee, fact-finding, Judiciary Committee, looking at constitutional law, you know, whether or not these are impeachable offenses. That's pretty much the difference. Thus, a bit of a snooze fest today, a bit of a historical constitutional law professor gab fest. And I got to tell you, Three out of the four were liberals. One was not necessarily even a conservative. He didn't even vote for Trump. John, Jonathan Turley, as uh, we've talked about so far. So definitely uh, one-sided and lopsided. And, you know, Democrats did them no, no favors today. I mean, I think they botched this hearing big time. And here, here's why specifically. You can't tell me you can't find one law professor in the United States that voted for President Trump and then now wants to see him impeached. Instead, we had three liberal law professors all saying, well, of course the president should be impeached. Well, you know what? I mean, give me a break. We knew that was going to happen. So I didn't think they brought it, uh, broke any new ground today. And when it's partisan like this and you want to move public opinion, you can't be more partisan. You have to somehow figure out a way to to, to uh, get more public on your side. I didn't do that today. Yeah, it felt very personal yeah. in some some cases. Uh, Jonathan Turley, who you just mentioned, mm -hmm. he called it a slipshod impeachment case. And at the same time, David, he said, I didn't vote for President Trump, and he doesn't sound like a big fan. What did you make of Jonathan Turley's comments? Well, I thought he was extremely powerful today and actually had a lot of credibility because he didn't vote for President Trump. That's a big deal right there. Look, he talked about bribery. He said, it's not bribery. All the Democrats are talking about bribery. So, look, bribery is very clear in Supreme Court precedent that there has to be an agreement between a campaign donation or a gift and some sort of uh, contract. Well, there, there was nothing here on that. And so I thought that was pretty powerful. He also said this is all based on presumptions, not proof. And that was another big line from today. Donald Trump has all along maintained that this is a hoax. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Vice President Mike Pence had closed door meetings with congressional Republicans on the Hill. On the other side of the Hill with Senate Republicans was Pat Cipollone, White House counsel, briefing them. Those meetings seem to indicate that the White House isn't treating this simply as a hoax. Well, it's, it's strategy. That's what it is. I mean, they, they think it's a hoax, for sure. When I say a hoax, I mean, they think it's ridiculous, but they have to have a strategy to combat the ridiculousness of all of it. Uh, look, I, I think it's important to go back to 1998. 1998, when Bill Clinton was under all of this impeachment investigation, 31 Democrats voted for a formal impeachment process to, to begin. Zero Republicans this time around. I understand it's 20-plus years later. But, you know, look, Jerry, even Jerry Nadler, and that video's going around on Twitter today, in 1998, Jerry Nadler even saying it cannot be a partisan exercise. Well, here we are. It's a partisan exercise. Yeah. Uh, Denny Heck, a Democrat from Washington State, mm -hmm. uh, he is on the Intelligence Committee. He announced today that he is leaving. He will not seek re-election. He said the impeachment hearings have, quote, rendered his soul weary. Uh, David, what is the signal to Democrats? Nothing whatsoever. He's the smartest man in America because I think we're all a bit weary and a bit, you know, our souls are just, you know, you got to be kidding me here. Even Jonathan Turley's dog. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if the dog is, if the dog is sad, I mean, when do dogs ever get sad? But, you know, if Jonathan Turley's dog is sad, right? And and this this congressman, he comes from a liberal district. This means nothing for Democrats, but what it does mean is that he's sick and tired of Washington D.C. and that makes millions of us because you, we all feel that way. Do you think there are others that might follow suit? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think it's a one-off. I, re I really do. Don't see any signals of that. Okay. Mm -hmm. David, thank you. Thanks, guys. Coming up, why world leaders are questioning Turkey's NATO membership. To have a sex before you marry is a bad idea. There's no such thing as gun violence. That just depends on your definition of when life begins. Watch Dan and Dale tackle trending topics that test your faith on the next Faith Wire.
Monday night at 9.30. The Global Lane takes you around the world, providing facts over fiction. What might rising trade and geopolitical tensions mean for you on the home front? With over 45 years of experience, award-winning journalist Gary Lane brings you the truth from a global angle. What about the issue of immigration? World news analysis you won't see anywhere else. And it's all right here on the Global Lane. Watch The Global Lane, Thursday night at The president is on his way back to Washington after canceling a final scheduled news conference at the NATO summit in London. The abrupt exit highlights the president's role as a stick in the eye at the 70th anniversary gathering of the military alliance. I want to take them to lunch. Crediting certain NATO members for ponying up, the president said lunch is on me at the end of the summit spent holding other members' feet to the fire. But these are countries that have met the goal of 2%. Uh, we have, unfortunately, uh, a large number that haven't met the goal. Some are very close, and they will be. The free lunch held in the wake of a tense few days of the disruptor-in-chief bulldozing through London. Germany's Chancellor Angela Merkel interrupting the president's tirade over trade imbalances between the U.S. and the European Union. My statements created some reactions and shake a little bit. A lot of people, I, I, I do stand by. After the French president doubled down, calling NATO brain dead, Emmanuel Macron sparred with President Trump over ISIS fighters in Syria. Would you like some nice ISIS fighters? Yes. I can give them you to you. Look at the you, can take, you can take everyone you want. <clears throat> Let's be serious. The president's tongue-in-cheek offer paired with real threats to alter foreign trade deals to bring delinquent NATO members to task. I'd be delinquent, I'd say, Canada, but they'll be okay. I have confidence. Just slightly delinquent. But after striking a softer tone with Canada's prime minister, cameras caught world leaders waiting for the president, drinking wine and saying, someone's late. The president responding, calling Justin Trudeau two-faced, a possible reference to a controversial 2001 photo of Trudeau in blackface. For all the cage rattling, the president received a warm welcome at Buckingham Palace from the Queen. And the president, who has threatened to pull the U.S. out of NATO, put himself at the center of the military alliance on the 70th anniversary. We're a very important player. I think without us, NATO certainly is not the same thing. Despite the diplomatic dust-up, Trudeau said he has a very good relationship with President Trump. And the commander-in-chief departed the summit thanking NATO and wishing everyone safe travels home on Twitter. Well, a few years after NATO began, Turkey officially joined the alliance. But after recent attacks in Syria, some are questioning whether it should still be a part of the group. Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell has that story. Turkey joined NATO in 1952, but recently, some like French President Macron wondered whether Turkey should continue to be part of the alliance. How is it possible to be a member of the alliance, to work with all of us, to buy our materials, to be integrated, and to buy the S-400 on ocean? Technically, it is not possible. Earlier, Macron said NATO suffered brain death in part because President Trump pulled out of Syria without consulting his NATO allies and because of Turkey's invasion of northeast Syria. When I look at Turkey, they now are fighting against those who fight with us, who fought with us, shoulder to shoulder against ISIS. And sometimes they work with ISIS proxies. 
This is an issue, and this is a strategic issue. Erdogan slammed the French president. Say Macron. Mr. Macron, I call on you from Turkey. I'll say it at NATO, too. You should get checked whether you are brain dead. Kicking Turkey out of NATO or not, how is that up to you? Do you have the authority to make such a decision? Many have criticized Erdogan's invasion of northeast Syria, including atrocities like this one, where Turkish-backed soldiers killed 12, including eight children, in a mortar attack. It's why Kurdish protesters took to the streets of London. NATO is still supporting him. The UK is still selling arms to him. America is still supporting him. And we need help because we don't have any power ourselves. Some believe Erdogan's strategy is to hold European leaders hostage with the threat of flooding the continent with millions of refugees, while at the same time pursuing his goal of ethnic cleansing along the Turkish-Syrian border. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Meanwhile, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is calling for greater sanctions on Iran. The regime is already dealing with sanctions put in place over its nuclear program. I think President Trump has placed uh, uh, tremendous uh, pressures and sanctions on Iran. I think we're seeing that. We're seeing the uh, Iranian empire totter. I think uh, it's important to increase this pressure uh, against Iranian aggression. We also see that Iran wants to march forward with uh, uh, nuclear bombs development and um, ballistic missile development, including precision-guided munitions. This has to be countered, and the way to counter it is more pressure. Then Netanyahu says Iran will be a topic of discussion as he meets tonight with Secretary of State Mike Pompeo in Portugal. And Iran's president said today he is willing to hold new talks with the U.S. only if sanctions are lifted. Coming up, churches coming to the rescue of families drowning in medical debt. Thanks for joining us for CBN's On the Home Front, where we highlight what the men and women of America's military do to defend our country. CBN honors the men and women in our military with an initiative called Helping the Home Front. It partners with churches across the country to meet the needs of their military families, from repairing homes to wiping out medical bills for wounded veterans. On the Home Front, Tuesday morning at 1030. If you want to be an attorney with a passion for serving people and for excellence, Regent University needs to be high on your list. Regent's award-winning law school doesn't just create lawyers. We create leaders, judges, prosecutors and defense lawyers, civil litigators and leaders in government. My focus has been trying to really make sure we have the future leaders we need for the, the bench and the bar and for society generally. You'll learn from highly credentialed leaders who are current and former judges, distinguished scholars, and ACLJ counsel. I'm so glad I chose Region. Uh, the relationships here have been amazing. The faculty have been amazing. Not everybody's called to the same thing when they leave law school, but they're called by a God who has a purpose for their lives, and He is going to use that education to make a difference in the world. Region will prepare you to be a purpose-driven, practice-ready lawyer. To start your rewarding law career, complete the online application, submit your transcripts, and take the law school admissions test by July. Apply today. I am Regents first ROTC graduate student. Thousands of dollars in medical debt suddenly wiped away. That is exactly what happened to a number of families in one Texas community. CBN's Caitlin Burke introduces us to two former medical debt collectors who found a way to give back and end the crippling debt some families face.
Thousands of Americans go bankrupt each year because of medical debt. The issue consistently polling as a top priority for 2020, and presidential hopefuls are taking advantage by pushing to reform a health care system that often sends patients home with surprise medical bills. Access to health care should be a right. I would call it Medicare for all who want it. Bernie Sanders plans to eliminate all of America's medical debt, saying, quote, I am sick and tired of seeing over 500,000 Americans declare bankruptcy each year because they cannot pay off the outrageous cost of a medical emergency or a hospital stay. Under his plan, the federal government would negotiate and pay off billions of dollars in unpaid medical debt that's already being held by collection agencies. It's a great idea, but here's the thing. It's already being done, not by the federal government, but by the church. We were able to, in partnership with RIP Med Medical, uh, to wipe away a little over $10 million in debt. Stephen Hayes is the senior pastor of Covenant Church in Dallas, Texas. On Easter Sunday last year, he congratulated his church for erasing the medical debt of community families and veterans. And so Covenant, because of your but not even be saying a thing or raising extra money because you've already been so generous. We had money set aside in our benevolence fund, our missions fund, because you gave above and beyond what was needed. Um, uh, 4,229 families this week will be getting a letter in the mail within a 20 mile radius of every campus saying your debt is completely gone. And get this, it only took a $100,000 donation from Covenant to wipe out $10.5 million in debt. If you're thinking the math doesn't quite add up, you're correct. Covenant teamed up with a nonprofit called RIP Medical Debt. We go find the debt that matches what our donors care about. Or we tell them over the next year, we're gonna be buying X amount of debt and would you please support us? So they'll support us that way instead of just generally what they always care about. So, and then what we do is we abolish it. It's a no-strings-attached gift. RIP Medical Debt, started by former debt collectors Craig Antico and Jerry Ashton, buys unpaid medical debt held by collection agencies, like where they used to work. By that point, it can be bought at significantly reduced rates. In the case of Covenant Church, each dollar donated bought $100 in debt. 100 to 1, or even a little more than 100 to 1, is an amazing return on a dollar. I mean, $10,000 gives a million dollars of debt forgiveness. $10 million abolishes a billion dollars of debt. A billion dollars of debt is about 300,000 people. Hayes says debt forgiveness is a familiar message to Christians and an effort the church should champion. So in scripture, uh, when Jesus uh, was on the cross, he made seven statements or seven different statements uh, before he took his last breath. And the sixth of those seven was the word tetelestai in the Greek, which means uh, it is finished. And that word tetelestai was the same word that other uh, tax collectors and other people that handled money would use when your bill was paid in full. It was like the big red paid stamp. So if you had a debt and you paid your debt, that tax collector would write on your debt, it is finished, tetelestai. Medical debt is a serious problem in the United States. Perhaps the church is the solution. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, Dallas, Texas. Well, former President Jimmy Carter is home from the hospital tonight. The 95-year-old had been admitted while being treated for a urinary, urinary tract infection this week. A spokesperson for the former president says he looks forward to further rest and recovery at home in Plains, Georgia, and that he and Mrs. Carter wish everyone peace and joy this holiday season. How a live nativity is being used in the fight for religious liberty on Capitol Hill. That story next. If you want to be an attorney with a passion for serving people and for excellence, Regent University needs to be high on your list. Regent's award-winning law school doesn't just create lawyers. We create leaders, judges, prosecutors and defense lawyers, civil litigators, and leaders in government. Ready to become a purpose-driven, practice-ready lawyer? To start your rewarding career, complete the online application, submit your transcripts, and take the law school admissions test by July. Nutrition, exercise, essential oils, weight loss, and more. 
It's Healthy Living with Lori Johnson. Talk about what's in this. Join CBN Health Reporter Lori Johnson to get the latest information from today's top health experts. This is fantastic. Find out what you need to know to live a healthier life. Watch Healthy Living, Tuesday night at 930. Superbook fans, here's something else you'll love. <laughs> it's the new Superbook Bible app. <laughs> it's packed with games, activities, and Superbook episodes that you can watch for free. Oh no! There's trivia, a fun daily devotional, and answers to your Bible questions. Plus, an easy to understand Bible the whole family will enjoy. You can even create your own Superbook character. Ta da! Man. Come uh, sorry, pardon me. Sorry, excuse me. Ouch! Are you getting this? Earn super points to win daily prizes, too. And so much more! <sighs> Time to get back to my adventures. See you soon. It's the new Superbook Bible app. Free downloads on iTunes, Google Play, and Amazon. Night for... Finally tonight, for some in America, the separation of church and state means keeping all things God away from all things government. But this holiday season, a group of Christian activists is fighting to bring the story of Jesus' birth right to the center of the action here in Washington. So why would a camel be hanging out on Capitol Hill? Well, it's not just for the fun of the tourist. There's actually a big point to be made here about your religious liberty rights. Each year, Christian activists fighting for those rights go between the U.S. Supreme Court and the U.S. Capitol to put on a live nativity scene, including baby Jesus and all the players gathered around his manger more than 2,000 years ago. A lot of people forget it between the hustle, the bustle, all the stuff that goes, the politics on Capitol Hill. There's a reason that we do this. It's the reason for the season, and it's the birth of Jesus Christ. Some might complain the specific location of this nativity scene violates the separation of church and state. Lawyer Matt Staver of the Liberty Council says it really doesn't. There is no separation of church and state that requires the government to censor religious viewpoints in speech. And this is clearly the essential message of the Christmas season. Our First Amendment right gives us the right to get permits and to hold different events on Capitol Hill. And our event happens to be our outreach, which is the live nativity. Because he is the bread of life, heralded by the hosts of heaven. Participants simply prayed, worshiped, and read from the Bible, nothing else. We're not mixing politics in with this. We're not pushing any type of legislation. We're just letting you know what the true reason, the true uh, time of the year is. And to share that with not only people here in the nation's capital, but the people around the world will be surprised as they see a live nativity in front of the United States Supreme Court. Paul Strand, CBN News, Capitol Hill. You know, Paul is a brave man. I was worried for him for a moment with that camel right behind his ear. Yeah, and it looks cold out there, too. <laughs> and it that little cold. baby. Bird. Brave baby. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's going to do it for tonight's Faith Nation. Have a great night.